We're now a week into the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Putin's forces have taken swaths of land in the south of the country, but are struggling to get control of Ukraine's two biggest cities, including its capital, Kiev. To talk through exactly what's been happening and why Putin's invasion isn't going quite according to his plan, I'm joined by Dmitry Alperovich, a security expert and chairman of the Silverado Policy Accelerator think tank in Washington, D.C., and Sir Lawrence Friedman, one of Britain's top military strategy experts and a professor at King's College London, who sat on the Chilcot inquiry into the Iraq war. Lawrence, could you start by briefly talking us through what's happened over the past several days in Ukraine and what is the state of the Russian invasion at the moment? Um, well, in its original form, it stalled uh, and I would say in some respects failed uh, in that the aim was to move quickly into uh, at least uh, Kiev and Kharkiv and uh, take the cities and ha execute re regime change, and that just hasn't happened. Um, I think it's taken a rather unpleasant turn um, because because it's stalled um, and, and because of the difficulties of urban warfare, uh, which are taking place. I mean, it's not as if they've given up completely on that, uh, but they've uh, the Russians have resorted um, to much more brutal tactics. Uh, it, it, with uh, strikes into, into the city centres. Um, this could be seen as softening up, um, but I think it's, in a way, also a sort of form of siege to make life miserable for the people there, coupled with shortages of um, uh, food and medicines. Uh, I don't think this will help Russia in the end. Uh, I think the, the most important thing that's happened uh, over the last few days is the mobilization of Ukraine um, that made what to me always seemed likely uh, a hopeless prospect for the, for the Russians if they ever try to occupy and control Ukraine. Uh, but that's made it even even harder. And so, uh, but it also means that the war will go on longer. Dmitry, as Lawrence suggests there, the invasion isn't going according to Putin's plan. He's increasingly turning to more aggressive measures, dropping heavy artillery against citizen areas in major Ukrainian cities. What do you make of the change in his plans? Well, what was most puzzling is that in an initial four to five days of the conflict, they really did not fight like they trained to fight. Um, Russian military is a heavy artillery military, uh, relying on, on standoff weaponry, uh, heavy weapons like um, missile strikes and uh, multiple uh, launch rocket systems uh, to accomplish their objectives. They did not use any of that. Uh, in fact, their, even their tactical bomber aviation was sitting on Russian airfields uh, virtually completely unused in those initial days because I think they had uh, a completely mistaken assumption that they could just roll into Kiev uh, with uh, you know a tank column armored vehicle um, uh, reconnaissance uh, company and, and take it over. Um, that uh, uh, turned out to be disastrous for them. And they've now reverted to the mean, which is uh, leveling cities like they had done in Chechnya with Grozny, like they had done in Syria and Aleppo. We're seeing indiscriminate targeting, inaccurate targeting into the centers of Kharkiv, into the centers of Kiev and other cities. Um, that is how they fight. That is their doctrine. And uh, unfortunately, they're now going to use overwhelming force and, and kill a lot of civilians to accomplish their objectives. Lawrence, will a bombardment of Ukraine, similar to what we saw the Russians do to Syria eight years ago and in Grozny and Chechnya in 1999, actually work? Um, well, I mean, the, 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 they can execute bombardments. It's much easier to, to fire off artillery from a distance than to, uh, uh, than to try to enter a city. Uh, I, I'm not sure. I'm, it, it's harder to do. I mean, the point is about Aleppo, say. Um, the aim was to depopulate areas, to push people out. And they had the Syrian infantry uh, sort of doing the, the work on the ground for them. Um, they haven't done anything like this for in, in terms of ground operations for a long time, which is one reason why um, they may not have quite captured what they needed to do, and uh, as Dmitry said. Um, but I don't think just bombarding will work for them. Even in Grozny, they still had to enter the city, and you can still fight amongst ru rubble. 
Uh, so it, it 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 doesn't solve problems, and you know to the extent they're actually attacking real targets rather than just indiscriminate, it really doesn't make a lot of difference if you if you knock out an administrative building. It, it, so it's not clear whether the, there's uh, a serious strategy behind this, or it's the sort of thing we do when when we when we're frustrated and uh, and we're trying to work out how to move this forward, and we're sort of hoping that the Ukrainians uh, might concede us a bit in, in the ceasefire talks. Uh, so I'm not quite sure if there's a clear end game in mind with all of this at the moment. Uh, Dimitri, is there any chance that the complete takeover of Ukraine by Russia is now gone, or is that still a very real possibility? Well, they can certainly take it. And, and by the way, they have made a lot of progress in the south. They took the city of Kherson, which is a pretty big city uh, in, in the last 24 hours. They've surrounded Mariupol, another huge city in the south. Uh, they're making progress towards the north uh, in Zaporozhye and towards the Dnipro. Um, so they are making progress. Uh, their offensive uh, is encountering much more resistance in the northeast, um, where I think they expected uh, a much easier time given that it's mostly a pro, uh, uh, Russian-speaking population that they assume would be pro-Russian. Um, and of course, uh, from the West, they, they are um, in the Kiev suburbs, uh, fighting, fighting the, uh, there's a pretty aggressive fighting there. Um, so uh, I think it's misleading to, to, to say that they, they haven't made any progress. Um, it's been slower than they expected, for sure, and they're taking more casualties um, than they thought they would, uh, but um, steadily but surely they're, they're taking progress and, and they have the forces to do so. The big question, of course, is what happens next? You can take the cities, you can decimate Ukrainian military units with airstrikes and artillery um, and then uh, surround them with your uh, ground invasion forces, but then what? Um, and uh, as Lawrence pointed out, the, the Ukrainian population is mobilizing. I know a lot of people um, that are sort of just regular people without any military backing that are going off to fight, kissing their kids for the last time and, uh, uh, you know, getting a rifle um, to, to go fight the Russians. So this, this can turn into a very nasty insurgency for them. It, it seems like it already is. Um, and holding the country afterwards, I think, is, is going to be an extraordinarily cha challenging for them. I mean, I'd go further. I think it's impossible. I just don't think they've got the numbers to hold a country. I mean, they certainly making progress in the south, uh, the forces coming in from Crimea, uh, and they can push forward. But, you know, this is a very large country. Uh, and uh, you need, you know, if you just think of the challenges that the Russians faced in Afghanistan, or even in, in Chechnya, that the Americans faced in Iraq and Afghanistan, if you have a, a serious insurgency, you need far more troops than, over a long period than they can really spare for this. So I think that in that sense, I think that they, 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 will, they will fail. Um, the question is, I suppose, what bargaining position they put themselves into uh, as you, uh, on the assumption that at some point this, there will have to be a negotiated conclusion. Mm. Lawrence, we saw reports in the Times this week that some 400 mercenaries on the orders of Moscow were sent into Kiev to hunt down Zelensky, the Ukrainian president. He has become a source of inspiration for the Ukrainian people and frankly for, for many people throughout the world. But will he have to decide whether or not to leave Kiev at some point soon? Well, the, the, the assumption to start with, was, was, and the Americans were, were urging this, is, is he, he needed to move out quite sharply. Um, you know, either go to Lviv or, or, or to form a government in exile even, and he made the decision to stay, which I think has turned out to be the right decision in terms of uh, the resistance being posed by by Ukraine. And it, it's interesting, the, 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 the qualities of leadership that can be shown, especially by somebody who knows to find words and deliver them. I mean, it does really help being an actor in, in, in these circumstances. And the comparison with Putin, you know, with his long tables and... Uh, scared of, of, of human contact is, is, is and sort of wooden and odd phrases is, is quite striking, um, but the issue could arise. I mean, the issue could certainly arise, uh, and you presume they will have thought about that. But it, I mean, he's not the only one. There's quite a number of senior Ukrainian politicians holed up in Kiev, and uh, at the moment they're saying they'll stay. Whether they'll see that if, if Russians genuinely are pouring into the centre. Uh, and there's a means of escape, we, we don't know. I think the worst thing would be for 
Zelensky to be captured by the Russians. I, don't, I think that would be a very bad turn of events. And Dmitry, to what extent is this resistance making a big difference to the outcome of the invasion that we've seen so far? Well, I don't think, unfortunately, it will make much of a difference to the Russian um, taking critical objectives, uh, like potentially taking Kiev. It will slow them down. It will uh, cause them to take more casualties. Unfortunately, it will also take them, make them to be much more brutal in their tactics. Uh, you know, you have to appreciate that the psychological element of this cannot be underestimated. Uh, Ukraine, and particularly eastern Ukraine and southern Ukraine, looks a lot like Russia. Um, lots of people speak Russian. If you see sort of a babushka on a street, uh, it looks like the soldier's grandmother. So psychologically, I think it's been very difficult for the Russians to fight this war in the initial stages because um, they've not been prepared. In fact, uh, it appears that most of the troops haven't even been told that they're going to invade Ukraine until the very last moment. Uh, there's been no realistic pretext. They don't understand why they're there um, and why they're shooting at people that look just like their family. However, I think that's starting to change now as they're taking severe casualties. Inevitably, that hardens people and um, they're becoming much more ruthless. You've seen some horrible war crime uh, videos come out of them just shooting up civilians um, and, again, indiscriminate targeting. Uh, and, and hitting um, universities, hitting schools, um, hitting, targeting hospitals. Um, so I think they're just going to get more and more brutal. And again, they can take their objectives. They, they did so, obviously, in, in Syria. They, they did so in Chechnya. Uh, but uh, the question is, can they hold them? And Lawrence, you were saying before that you weren't convinced that Russia could actually stage a long-term occupation. Is there any way that you think that this invasion could still seem like a success for Putin? Well, um, I mean, it, 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 it depends on the outcome. Uh, I don't think it won't achieve a success in, in the sense there'll be a puppet regime. Um, because no, no regime that isn't backed by occupation forces will be seen as legitimate. And could cope. Remember, this is a country that's twice seen moderately pro-Russian presidents overturned by popular movements because they were believed to be rigging elections. So I don't think, um, in that sense, they they can succeed. Uh, it's the very difficult to judge what success looks like. I mean, if if Putin really believes this is a country run by drug addicts and Nazis, then you can say, well, look, there's no drug addicts and Nazis. If you're saying that. This is a country that's trying to get nuclear weapons. Say no, well, you know, we won't get nuclear weapons. Um, so you, you, you can the way that it's been phrased as a special operation and so on makes it actually hard to know how how you present the result back back home. I think in practice, it's going to be difficult to have an agreement that doesn't recognise uh, Ukraine as an independent state. Uh, so what you're then talking about is finding things that you can do um, that seem to acknowledge um, some of, of Russians, Russian concerns, perhaps uh, confirm the annexation of Crimea and so on. I, I think a peace deal is possible, but it's actually quite difficult at the moment. E uh, and it won't become easier just because uh, you, you've, uh, you, you've, caused, uh, you've committed more crimes and, and, and uh, made the situation in... in uh, Ukrainian city is more horrific. In some ways, it becomes harder. Dimitri, what do you make of that? No, I completely agree. I think uh, the atrocities that they're committing have turned virtually all Ukrainians, except those that are still collaborating around the pay of the uh, Russians, uh, in, into enemies for them. And um, I think that hardened resolve uh, will stay for a very long time. And uh, it's going to be very, very difficult for them to run an occupation. Now, having said that, I don't think we should underestimate uh, Russia's counterinsurgency capabilities. Um, if you look at what they did in Chechnya with extreme brutality, with torture, with war crimes, they have uh, largely pa pacified that area. We, we haven't seen terrorist attacks in, in Chechnya in a very long time. And they've done it actually rather quickly. Um, they, they, they started the second Chechen war in 1999 towards the later uh, 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 of, of the year, to the second part of the year, and um, largely completed their counterterrorism operations there by about 2004, 2005. So within five or six years, they've managed to pacify it, and uh, 
there's just an incredible article that I read uh, back in 2015 where uh, the journalist was interviewing a Chechen jihadist in Istanbul who was on the way to Syria that just highlights the, the, the uh, uh, Russian victories in Chechnya because they were asking this person, why are you going to Syria to fight the Americans and Assad when you can be in Chechnya fighting the Russians? And he said, it's literally f safer for me to be in Syria because in Ch Chechnya, you know, you're holed up in the mountains, you have to come down from the mountains into the villages to get supplies and everyone has mobile phones, they'll immediately call the Russians on you because they would fear that if they don't and the Russians ever find out, they'll massacre the whole village. That's how the Russians fight insurgencies, extremely brutal, committing war crimes, uh, but uh, they are able to achieve results in many of these cases. Um, obviously failed in Afghanistan, but uh, did work in Chechnya. So um, we'll see if they're going to resort to these uh, horrendous tactics in Ukraine to try to keep the population pacified. I do think that at this point, uh, Putin must be um, rethinking uh, his initial uh, assumptions about this, this conflict. Um, he really did I think, I think that he was going to be treated as liberator and that the Ukrainian forces would just melt away and, and go home. Um, having seen the resistance that he's encountering and thinking about the long-term cost of occupations here, occupation here, he may be um, thinking that he could pressure Zelensky, perhaps with threat of death, um, to try to get some concessions. I think the minimum bar for him would be for Ukraine to recognize Crimea as Russian, for Ukraine to uh, forever abandon its pursuit of NATO and EU membership and some sort of agreement on demilitarization and a memo, no more weapons supplies from, from NATO. I don't think that Zelensky would take that deal, even uh, under threat of death, uh, but uh, Putin may be trying to go for that, um, uh, for that, for that strategy. Uh, Lawrence, last question to you. You wrote this week, it is now as likely that there will be a regime change in Moscow as in Kiev. As likely, yes. What would a coup in Moscow look like? Oh, I don't know. I mean, uh, all, I, mean I, I think as long as he isn't captured and killed, Zelensky will in effect be the president of Ukraine for some time to come now. Um, whereas Putin's position has been uh, challenged by this. Uh, uh, I think you need to know an awful lot more about what's going on amongst the Russian elite to be, to be sure. I, I, won't, I mean, the Russian population, as far as we can tell, is, is, is broadly supportive because what do they know? I mean, they're told on, on the Russian media um, the, 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 uh, that they don't hear the alternative voices. It's extraordinary how many brave people there have been who have spoken out, but still, it's, it, this isn't going to be a popular movement. I think it'll be uh, worries amongst the Russian elite uh, about the, the total isolation of their country and the economic hurt that's coming. The sanctions are far more severe than I expected. I think most people expected. Uh, I'm sure the Russians expected. And though they've got a war chest, it's not all, not all of that's doing them much good at the moment. So I think the, um, the problems that Putin faces over the long term are, are, are quite serious. It would be foolish to predict um, that, that he'll go tomorrow or... Uh, weeks or day uh, or months or whatever. I just think his position uh, is going to be hard to recover for, uh, from uh, what is this, uh, what you said, a staggering mis misjudgment that he's made. Um, so, we, but we have to see. Dimitri, do you think a Kremlin coup is a possibility? Look, I think it's uh, not very likely, but the chance of it is no longer zero. If you had asked me two, three weeks ago, uh, what is the likelihood that Putin would be ousted in, in sort of a palace coup, I, w I would tell you that it was zero. Uh, today, it's no longer that. And I think it is precisely because the sanctions have been so severe and the diplomatic isolation, which also cannot be underestimated, uh, is uh, rapidly turning Russia into a North Korean type of pariah state. So um, when you look at the elites, particularly the, the military and intel services, uh, people that have enriched themselves over decades, that have, uh, through their families, bought properties and uh, yachts and, and other luxuries in the West, and they're now realizing they're in danger of losing it all. And also realizing, most importantly, that those sanctions are not getting removed as long as Putin is in power. No matter what happens in Ukraine, even if uh, uh, Putin manages to achieve some sort of rapid victory there, um, those sanctions are there to stay. Russia will remain isolated economically and diplomatically for years to come 
if this man is still in power. And I think it's not out of the realm of possibility, small chance, very small chance, but not zero, that someone, particularly in the Siliviki sort of hardliner movement there, will say, the old man has made a dr drastic mistake. We've had enough. It's time for him to step aside. Lawrence and Dimitri, thank you so much for joining Spectator TV. Mm -hmm.